I just introduce Joe to you? I mean, I'm sure you all know of Joe, or read works by Joe. I'm lucky enough to have met Joe when I had black hair too, which was about 20 years ago. Uh, so I regard him as a friend as well as me. And I would say that over the last 20 years he has been one of, if not the most influential person, as far as I'm concerned, in talking about language policy generally. I mean, he's written countless books and articles. It, it's a problem if you're on Joe in a project because you have pages and pages of bibliography to put in there. You have to cut them down on many issues related to that, not just about Australia, but around Asia and other countries as well. His most recent publication, I think, is on China. We might hear something about that later on in some discussion. He also produced something about language planning and student experiences that came out very recently from uh, Multilingual Matters, which is a, which is a, a great introduction of the, the difference between planning policy and reality. And I think it's a, it's a really good book. But he's not just an academic, not actually just an academic, it's great to be an academic, but Joe has also been involved in the practice of policy and multilingualism. He wrote, probably not single-handedly, but significantly the Australian National Policy on Languages and headed that up. And in fact, he'd been so involved that I suppose it's a sign of uh, Joe's role in languages that he's even recently written an article in the Australian Educational Research, what does C stand for? Compendium of Educational Research? Criticizing his own policy uh, <laughs> from, 20 years, from, from 15 or 20 years earlier. Uh, so, if you want to know about language policy and multilingualism, we are so delighted that Joe has come all the way from Melbourne. His latest uh, venture is into language and peacekeeping, working for the UN, which is going to be starting fairly soon. My great pleasure to Thank you very much. Hi, good morning, everybody. It's very, very nice to be here. I'll just um, take a moment to get the uh, PowerPoint. Just to show you that I support national industries, I flew Bulgaria Air to get to Gardner. Can you hear me? Because I'd rather not lose the, I've got a loud voice, but I noticed this article in there, which is very relevant to, I thought it would be relevant to us, called Cities of the Future. Now, of course, like a lot of these technological utopias, it talks about, I read it all in Bulgarian, and the translation is not very good, I have to say. <laughs> You know, this kind of thing, the technological utopia of the future. Absolutely nothing about human beings. You know, like human beings count as numbers. You know, 25 million people living in an urban space. But nothing about how we talk to each other. This is completely normal. This is how, actually, journalists are blind to human interactions very often, just like historians and political scientists are blind to the importance of language. Um, I'll have something to say about, about that as I go on. But I just wanted to mention to you, because I was surprised, as I saw that yesterday as I, as I came in. But look, it's a very great pleasure to be here. And um, as you can see, the topic of my talk, I, I called it the Cosmopolis, or Cosmopolis. So I made that word up. And I really like it a lot, and I'm going to describe something about it in a minute. But what I really mean is something of the combination between the words cosmopolitan and polis, you know, the, 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 you know, the Greek uh, public shared space, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. So urban life and multilingualism, which I think is an enormous challenge of the future. But I want to say, firstly, thank you very much to uh, the people who invited me, and congratulations to all the people on the city reports. I've read all your reports. I know the situation quite thoroughly. I was just in Rome, and I visited some of the places in the Rome report that actually were highlighted there and took my own photographs of it, so I was really delighted to do that. And I know London pretty well, so I know some of those settings quite well, and I was delighted to see that. I think we've got magnificent data in what you have there. I'm not going to be able to talk about it very much, but um, it, it was a great pleasure to see it. Now, as uh, Lid said, my professional work is language policy. I do both theory of language policy and planning, and also the practice of it. I'm a practitioner 
Um, I work in even the jungles, actually, of Burma and southern Thailand. Um, do we have a pointer by any chance? Is that a pointer? No. A laser pointer? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad idea. <laughs> okay. Look, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about the work I'm doing because it is really immediately relevant, but, sorry, it is relevant but not immediately relevant. But basically, this is produced by the United Nations who have uh, engaged me to work on conflict-affected areas. You can see the number four and the number one, and then you can see at the bottom of Thailand, just on the Thai border with Malaysia, a number three. And those are three conflict areas. In fact, in the number three, there have been 160 teachers murdered in the last seven years, 160 among the nearly 7,000 other people killed. And the teachers are killed deliberately because they teach the wrong language, they use the wrong script, they propound the wrong religion. So this is a serious conflict around ethnicity and language. So theory is important and help helpful, but what really matters is getting people to talk about a new way in which they can work together. And um, this is very relevant to what I'm going to be saying, although my references will not be to Southeast Asia. Then number four, all the way down to number one, is the border between Thailand and Burma, Myanmar. Myanmar has 110 languages, plus uh, English and Chinese, and uh, Hindi, and uh, Bangla, the official language of Bangladesh, spoken by the Rohingya Muslims who are very persecuted in the south of the country. And then we are doing seminars in all the areas to try and get local solutions to the, the problems. Because as you know, Burma is coming out of 50 years of very brutal dictatorship towards a more open, democratic future. It's a magnificent, extraordinary country, but full of incredible problems. So that's what I do. I do very practical kind of work, as well as um, theory work on language policy and planning. So. Some of what I'm going to say to you comes from these hot zones. The red refers to a hot zone of conflict. Um, and some comes from Australia, which is hot in other ways. Um, but I have to say, before I put together my talk, I was shocked to learn that someone else has used the word cosmopolis. I was horrified. It's actually a, it's actually a film. I'm going to take a copyright action against them. But it turns out to be really quite relevant because it has the complete opposite meaning to what I have in mind. And one of the ways we understand things is by looking at their opposites as much as looking at their similarities. And Cosmopolis, I managed to get a little uh, view of it online, is this kind of film. The reviewers have called it a film about rapid, difficult conversations mostly taking place in a car. <laughs> as it turns out, it's a stretch limousine going from one side of New York to the other side of New York so the guy can get a haircut, which is what I failed to get before I came here because I, I was uh, rushing about too much. But anyway, and I don't own a stretch limousine. Um, it's very interesting because obviously you can see what the filmmaker is trying to do, to have all these conversations happening on a mobile phone in a stretch limousine is a choice, a choice not to interact with the person who's next to you. If you're in a stretch limousine, which is protected in all sorts of ways, you're making a choice to be antisocial, or rather antisocial in a particular kind of way. I think it's really interesting. I think it's the opposite of Cosmopolis. And maybe they're using the term, as you said about Kabafi, maybe they're using it ironically. Um, it's a timely indictment of our finance-driven way of life, because this guy is a mega millionaire, <coughs> mega billionaire. It's a bleak, destructive, deconstructive comedy, but then it's still worth watching. Okay, it seems to be about this wunderkind, this narcissist New York financial multimillionaire who trashes all his money inside this film. His name is Eric Packer, and he ends up doing all these kinds of things in his car. He has sex with several women, none of whom are his wife, we're told that. Um, he has, he threatens to kill people, he's threatened to be killed himself. He's obviously not your role model for teaching children. 
but it's obviously not that kind of, of cosmopolis that I have in mind today. I have a different kind. I'm interested in urban space and communication, and it links together different semantic fields. First, the idea of cosmo, cosmopolitan, which obviously you think about as um, Greek origins, we're talking about multiplicity, and we're talking about the polis, the place in which a shared space where we come together. So uh, those, are, but there's another word, cosmopolitan, and I don't mean that one either, and that's this. Do people know this one? Yeah. But this is actually very relevant too, because there's another meaning for cosmopolitan, which is not the one I mean, and it's not this one. And what I mean here is this, a cosmo. And I don't know, I actually never watched this show, but um, my daughter did a thesis on, um, a minor thesis on this film, Sex and the City. And it's about New York urban life, and particular life for young women uh, in this city. And the cosmopolitan is, can you read the grey? I hope you can, probably. It's apparently, I've never had a cosmo, I'm going to ask for it at the hotel tonight, and see if they can make one. You need vodka, which I'm sure you have in this part of the world, triple sec, cranberry juice and freshly squeezed lime juice. The important thing about this is not the drink, but the talk that goes with the drink. Because this is an idea of how to be an urban animal today. And it's deeply monolingual, deeply ethnocentric and deeply English-based. This is the way a lot of people who promote English as a lingua franca in the world today think. I wish I could talk to you about four hours about this, but I can't. But let me just read what's here. This noun cosmopolitan, oh, I've repeated the word, I'm sorry, is a cocktail, obviously, but links to cosmopolitan as an adjective, as in a cosmopolitan space, in the following way. Kelly Bradshaw, this young woman, used to order these all the time when she was out with the girls. Then at one point in one of these scenes, one of her girlfriends asks her, why are we not drinking the Cosmo anymore? And she says, we, we used to drink it all the time. And she says, because everyone else started. In other words, you only do things that no one else does as long as you're ahead of them. That is a very different meaning of cosmopolitan. It means about uh, something about being different, but not in the traditional way we understand difference. It means elitist kinds of difference. So the reason I mentioned both the film and the cocktail is because we're dealing with narcissism in urban spaces. And some of the quotes, Rousseau's quotes and some of the other quotes about cities, traditionally from people who love the rural space as the place of authenticity, of honesty. If you think of any national tradition, it must be true in Bulgaria too, although I don't know. You think of any national tradition, you'll find that what they love most is the past, the rural and the simple life. Because the past and the rural and the simple life are where ordinary, honest uh, life activity resides, where the purest forms of Norwegian are spoken. When they were developing Norwegian language in the 19th century to make it different from Danish, they went to the, the uh, parts of Norway furthest away from the cities to get the purest, uncontaminated, most authentic, uh, things, because in the city you're supposed to get impurity and uh, corruption. So this is a very deep idea in Western culture, that urban spaces are places where things get soiled and damaged, and languages are seen to get soiled and damaged. So we have these contradictory views. On the one hand, the urban space is where exciting things happen. On the other hand, the urban space is where things become corrupted. Carrie and her friends don't really want to belong to the minorities that live in New York City, which is, of course, one of the most diverse cities on Earth. They want to be seen to be very different from that. Their values massively contradict many of the values of the populations in that city. Well, that's normal. They're also monolingual in English. Quite often, they make clear points. You know, this is a city where Spanish is spoken by huge numbers of people. I did my PhD on the politics of English and Spanish in the United States, and you can tell very clearly when people are signaling, because in America, PC often means you cannot actually say what you mean. So that's why they have dog whistling. You know the term dog whistling? Dog whistling means you're suggesting an idea without actually stating it. When you whistle for a dog, 
It's beyond the audible range of the human ear, but dogs can hear it. Now, in, uh, in political correctness, sometimes you can't say things that you really believe, and that's called dog whistling, where you signal what you really think, but you can't be accused of having said it. So there's a lot of dog whistling in these films. This is a place of smart talk and dog whistling and cool urban hip English. And this is a very important thing. When we look at young people's choices about their languages, we must keep in mind that the way English is presented in the world is to capture a lot of this world against other languages that are seen to capture the old, the past, and the rural. Okay. The policy I have more in mind is something like this one, of course. Urban life and multilingualism. So if we link them, but we have to add the Roman Forum, because the Greek polis was based on ethnos, the idea of belonging only if you were part of the dominant ethnic group. Someone mentioned Galerius's Edict of Toleration. There was an even more relevant one, which is Caracalla's 212 Edict of Citizenship. It's the first time in Western political life that it was admitted that you could have a political state in which people belonged to that state as equals who were not from there. So then you had Caracalla, who was himself a North African emperor. You had Septimius Severus, who was born in Tunisia, or is now modern Tunisia. You had the idea in the Roman, in early Roman Empire and late Roman Empire of a multi-ethnic polity. This is a really different thing. Belonging despite your ethnic difference. Quite different from the Athenian idea that belonging required sameness. But Europe has always struggled with these two things. Belonging to nation states really historically means belonging to a particular privileged linguistic and ethnic uh, class. The contemporary mega city is a completely opposite vision of this, as we will see as we go on. Now, you can see the quotes there. These talks raise questions of theory that are very, very relevant to Lucy, but they also raise questions of very practical things. How do you deliver health services in a city in which you get a lot of poor people who speak minority languages who might actually not even be literate in those languages? So they're both questions of major theoretical importance, historical importance, and very practical questions of the delivery of services. We should never be afraid of talking of those two things together. They're always the same. I'm going to talk about Plato later, and I just, I'm not going to say this later, but I just want you to remember, Plato is one of the classic, I did political philosophy in my first degree, in economics and political philosophy. Never once, during the whole four years of this degree, did any of my lecturers tell me why Plato wrote the Republic. They only talked about his vision. If you actually go and look at why he wrote The Republic, I'll tell you a little bit about it actually later, you'll see that he was actually concerned with some very practical problems. He couldn't care less about 20th century philosophy courses. He was interested in helping Dionysus II of Syracuse stay in power. The practical and the theoretical are always closely linked in reality. It's only in universities, unfortunately, that we separate them. Okay. In the forum or the polis, talk is not like Carrie and her friends in Sex and the City. Talk here in the city is deliberative. In other words, it's about decision making. It's a purposive, it's argumentative, it's representative. And when it's about languages, I'll let you have these slides, you don't have to worry if you can't take the notes on them. Language rights, language opportunities, and language enrichment. Already people have said the classic problem of foreign language learning. I don't think we can talk about foreign language learning anymore in the future of the world. There's no such thing as a foreign language. English is not a foreign language to uh, Bulgarians. I bet that Bulgarian young people listen to English mediated music regularly. That isn't what people imagined when they talked about foreign language teaching and learning a long time ago. And I think we have to think about English in a quite different way. And as Lid said, we have to talk about the elephant in the room. We can't promote multilingualism unless we deal with English and the real world presence of English. Um, it doesn't mean we fall under the spell of it, but it means we have to understand the functions that English serves 
and we have to find alternative messages for other languages. We have to accept what English does, but actually accept that English can't do everything and can never do everything, and certainly can never do some of the things that other languages do. Now, I say that coming from Australia. We have 150 indigenous languages. 80 of these languages are spoken by fewer than 100 people. I don't know how many people are in this room, but we have probably 50 languages that are spoken by only the number of people in this room. Believe me, we know about language death. Since the British colonisation of Australia, we have lost 112 languages. They have become extinct. So, I think the story of language loss is something that Australia knows better than any other country on earth. Um, no languages, no major languages in Europe are threatened with that. They might be threatened with restriction in their domains, even Swedish is. If you look at Swedish, you know, continual teaching of nuclear physics and science in Swedish universities in English means that people who are graduates of these courses can't really talk about those things. If their grandmother says, what did you do at university when you go over for Christmas or something or other, it's unlikely they can explain it in Swedish. Not that you would tell your granny about nuclear physics possibly, but do you know the point I'm trying to make? If you don't use the discourse and vocabulary of something regularly in that language, you're not going to know how to do it. No matter how good you are at translating, you won't have the vocabulary, you won't have the discourse items. You will understand the concepts because mentally we can translate them. You will not be able to talk about it. And I believe that young Swedish people, even young Germans, who do, you know, Germany is a massive language, it's spoken in many countries, there's a huge society of great energy and force and science and stuff like that. And yet, most German scientists publish their work in English. Now, you cannot do that continually and not expect there will be some consequences for your discursive ability in that language. Is it clear what I'm trying to say? Even for the biggest languages. So imagine what that means for tiny indigenous languages that have never been part of academic life at all. Obviously it means the potential obliteration of the face of the earth. So, you know, if, if Greek, which is a major language in Australia, or Italian, our most important language after English, if they stopped being used in Australia, they would still exist in Europe and in America and other places. But if Pitinjana isn't used anymore in Australia, it's not used anywhere, anywhere else on Earth. And it's not just a few sounds we lose, but it's a whole way of understanding and interpreting the world. I know I'm not telling you something strange, you all understand that. So this is the kind of talk that we should be doing, not about you know, foreign languages. I think the term foreign language is strange and we shouldn't even use it anymore. And the most important part of this story is the state. And I don't use the term nation state, I prefer the term national state. Now I'd like you to imagine, is it possible to write here? Okay. Imagine a vertical line. Ah. Okay. Here I've got a vertical axis, like this. And a horizontal axis, like that. On this vertical axis, I think we have what we'll call the state. On this horizontal axis, we have what we could call the nation or the nations. We need, as language researchers, we need, as language academics and as language teachers, we need to understand this kind of world better. When we talk to policy makers, when we talk to municipal officers, health officials, you, it might not seem to you to be relevant, but it is relevant. They have, as Lorna very, very nicely put it before, people have an image of what it means to be a bilingual person. People who are clearly bilingual saying they're monolingual. The reason they're doing that is because they're work, working off a system which says that languages belong to nations and nations should have their own state. And yet there are 7,000 languages spoken in the world but 196 nations. Think about that. That means that there are, I'm not very good at mathematics, but there are 7,000 minus 196 languages that do not have a state, that do not have a national state. And some countries like Spain, which have gone through the process of devolution to respond to this, 
see that there are risks in that. One of the risks in that is the possible dissolution of the state itself. This is a really important dynamic. And all state officials worry about this. They worry about it all the time. The reason Canada is an officially bilingual country is because the Quebecois said, we're out of here, guys. We want our separate nation. We want to be a separate national state. And so Pierre Proudhon said to them, no, we can be a bilingual country. We will make French valid from Quebec all the way to Vancouver, rather than just over in the East Coast. See what I'm trying to say? The, the state is the vertical authority. Within the state, you have the military, you have the taxation raising system, you have the delivery of services, efficiency delivery of services, citizenship. That's what happens within the state. We have to learn to separate the state, which should be uniform. It should be equal for everybody. The law should be the same for everyone, regardless of your ethnicity, your language, and stuff like that. But across the state, we have now, in every country on Earth, massive diversity and growing diversity, and nothing's going to stop it. If Bulgaria passed a law tomorrow saying, we will always be what we are today, I can guarantee you 100% it would not work. It's not going to happen. No state on Earth is going to be able to quarantine itself <coughs> from what's happening. The European Union already represents an acceptance that this is impossible. We cannot retreat to the nation state anymore. And I wish, and I'm sorry about this, but there just seem to be far too few people in Europe who have a proper vision of the historical moment we're in. Like you talk about the European Union in the worst kinds of ways. There is so much of importance that's happening through the transnational experiment of the European Union, and yet it's disgusting. Because I read the British newspapers, and I'm a discourse analyst as well. I'm collecting hundreds of anti-European statements from the <laughs> British press. And it's like the biggest database on the face of the planet. If you go to the conservative papers in England, I can tell you they do not love the European Union one little bit. And they love to hate it very much. But what it's really important to do is to accept that we need to talk about the two kinds of nation. The solid stable, singular nation of the state and the diverse, horizontal nation of identity. The horizontal axis, where we have the bonds of attachment, affiliation, sentiment, and even ideology. There, I can have my political opinion with you, but we might be different from you. There, we can have our own special attachment to the fact that we both come from the south of Italy and we love our very funny Greek that we speak in the south of Italy. See what I'm trying to say? At the cross the nation, we have all our incredible diversity. But in the state, we want uniformity. Okay. Before the nation state, which people think is like the permanent condition of humanity, believe me, it's not. For most of human life, the nation state didn't exist. No one had anything like the nation state. It's not going to be around forever. It's already starting to be transcended. But even in Asia, I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly um, a bit later. For most of human history, this part of the world, um, I, I think it was the House of Osman, the Ottomans, the Romanovs, and the Habsburgs basically ruled the huge zone of Eastern Europe for a really, really long time. All the nationalities and ethnicities and language groups who lived there didn't disappear, they were there. Um, basically, the formation of nations in that huge space happened later and is now, it's not dissolving, but it's actually emerging. We're having multiple kinds of uh, connections and identities. So human organization of geographical space has been very different. People talk about lingua franca. Lat when Latin was a lingua franca and we had national universities, this place is called Wagner Free University. The first university in Europe was in Bologna, created in 1088. The first students who went to study in Bologna wouldn't, didn't imagine themselves to be Italian. Italy didn't exist. They came from Hungary. They came from Bulgaria. They came from North Africa. They came from England. They studied in the lingua franca of Latin. If you go to Bologna University, you see the plaques of the learning nations. There were organizations of the students who would try to keep the lecturers honest by buying the lecturers' time. 
who would force the lecturer to teach in a kind of Latin that they could understand, who would buy space from the local landlords to stop the student from being ripped off. They were like unions of the students from different national groups. The universities were international before they were national. That's the point I'm trying to make. And they had a common language, but that didn't stop them from being Hungarian and whatever else. Having English as a common language is not a problem, as long as we put it in its place. That's the point I'm trying to make. We couldn't talk today if we didn't have shared English. The fact that we have shared English doesn't stop you, I presume you're a Bulgarian speaker, or, and whatever. it doesn't stop anything as long as we understand the functional roles of languages are particular to those roles that we give them. We're in control of this. Okay. It's a longer, bigger, more subtle philosophical argument, but basically that's it. A large part of the creation of the nation was what Joshua Fishman called nationing of people. Persuading people that they weren't what they were, but that they were something else. They belonged to the nation. And to a large extent, that persuaded them that they didn't have the languages they had, they had other languages. So language planning was done mostly by statesmen and soldiers, not as uh, Keduri, an Arab professor, talks about, professors of linguistics or collectors of folklore. So the way to think about this is geographical space, undifferentiated with lines. We're moving towards a kind of borderlessness, that is, borderless, a borderless world. The borders are still there, but they're much more porous. People move across them more readily. No one, I have two passports. I, I just basically show my passport when I come across the space. The only time they give me a difficult time is in London, because I have also an Australian passport, obviously, and they don't want me to know what I'm about that. <laughs> um, so basically the idea of nationing people, persuading them that they belong to nations, was an important part of what national states did. And as Joshua Fishman said, national languages will not go away, but national languages have three functions, basically. Have efficient administration within a bordered space, to provide authenticity for some groups within that space, and unification. But other than that, we have hundreds of other functions in our lives, recreational ones, ideological ones, intellectual ones, personal identity ones, we have multiple identities. This does not exhaust all of our possibilities. Okay, so a large part of this was not done by nations, that's making human spaces monolingual, that's what the nation state tried to do. A lot of it was done by people acting as little vigilante groups in a very interesting process called shibboleth tests. And there is a long history of this. A colleague of mine at Melbourne University, Tim McNamara and Kasten Rova, have done this great study and they looked at Chippewa tests done all over the world. The English used it against the Danes, the Arab Yemenis against non-Arab African slaves in 1060, etc., etc. You can see it. Basically, it's a way of testing whether people speak the right way for belonging in this geographic space. And if they don't, they're punished usually historically by death. That was one of the ways of making geographic space synonymous with language, obviously extremely violently. So it was done through human direct action as well as laws. Now this tells us something very important about what language policy is. Language policy is both the behavior we exercise on each other as human beings, influence, persuasion. Now think about this as Lucy writers of city reports. If you want to go to a hospital in Athens or Rome or Osijek or I don't know, Utrecht or somewhere or other and persuade the administrator in that place that it's a good idea to employ interpreters or it's a good idea to think about a communication policy and not just about you know how to get the medicines in, you have to deal with a history and that's embedded in our brains which says that spaces are language specific. That's what we, it's a European idea to a large extent, and it's generally not a good one. But it's one that we have a long history of, and it's gonna take a long time to remove out of our system. But if you think about language policy as something that the government does, 
then you're giving them too much credit. We do it ourselves. Teachers do it when they teach. When a teacher teaches students, they don't just teach them language, they teach them attitudes to language. They teach them ways to communicate with language. They teach them ideology. I, I have some stuff that I won't be able to use about this. It's too long already, my talk. But there is a lot of this. We survey space and we say, is this space appropriately used for this language all the time? We do it with other things as well, behaviour and so on. But I'm talking just about language today. And that produced this. There was an English book produced by a colleague of mine at the um, Australian National University recently, Anna Birchbicker, a Polish-Australian, very brilliant uh, academic. I don't actually agree with her approach to that language, but she's a genius uh, academic. And she produced this book called English, Meaning and Culture. And on the cover of the book, she put this. And what this is, is a classic English painting. And it's what in English art is called the conversation piece, which is really very funny because as you can see, no one's talking here. <laughs> it's a silent conversation piece. What it's really saying, and these, you know, I don't know, I grew up on a farm. My parents were share farmers, you know, poor share farmers on a farm in, in Australia, and no one goes to a farm dressed like this. <laughs> you know, this lady does not look like you dress when you go to a farm. You normally have boots on and you have gloves or something like that. You don't dress with a pink or purple, whatever colour that is, blue hoop skirt. That's for going to a ballroom. So why does the artist constantly, why does he do this? He's saying they belong to this place and this place belongs to them. These are 18th century English people speaking English in an English place. This is a kind of environment that belongs to Englishness. You see, ideologically, how we have done it in our art, in our talk, we have attached meaning, language, basically deep semantic associations to place. So for people who move, whether they are migrants or nomadic people, like Aboriginal people who are in Australia, for anybody else, you struggle deeply against this history of association of place with language, with identity, with particular ways to be. And it takes a very big leap into theory with the work of Dante Alighieri in 1303. Now he's most famous, obviously everyone knows him as Italy's great poet, but he's much more important than being just Italy's great poet. He's a great poet, but he's very important for this book, which is one of my favourite books. It's called Nero Gad Eloquencia, and he wrote it in Latin. If you understand Latin, what he's really saying is on eloquence in the vernacular, on making the vernacular eloquent. And what he's saying here is something incredibly important. He looks to France and he looks to Spain and he says they've got a court and they've got a national state. We are divided, we're colonized, we're controlled by everybody else. And the reason is because we don't have a national language. If we had a national language, we would have a state, a national state. See where the logic starts. The, the beginning of the vernacular languages in Europe starts with him. In this little book, which he wrote incredibly and ironically in Latin. He didn't write it in Italian. He's, it's an argument for Italian, but he writes it in Latin. But it's also very brilliant because of a theory in there about how you create a national language. It's got a normative it's got a theory of corpus linguistics, basically, from the 14th century. It's very wrong by what we understand corpus linguistics to be today. And it's got a pretty weird classification of the world's languages, but it was a very long time ago. Um, and it didn't have computers. But it's, it's a piece of genius from many, many points of view. The interesting thing about this is he doesn't finish the book. He writes volume one and half of volume two, and then he abandons it, and a few years later he starts his great work, The Comedy, which 200 years after that is called The Divine Comedy, and he writes the comedy in Italian. So he invents the language that he's theorizing about. So he stops being a theoretician, and he becomes a practitioner. And he changes, he actually ended up making the country possible. So even a poet can change language policy and indeed politics. It might take 600 years, but it can do it. 
Now, I'm sure that within Bulgarian history, within any national history within Europe, you will find many, many instances like this. What I'm trying to tell you is that language policy is made this way too. It's made discursively. The law is one thing, but the law only happens within a context in which it's possible. What we would call the conditions of possibility. That's what he created. That's what people create when they talk and argue. We create people's acceptance. If we, so what I'm going to tell you is if we talk about multilingualism as a natural, normal thing, in time we will make it a natural, normal thing, if we are persuasive. That's what it comes down to. So I can sit down now because that's my basic message here. <laughs> and save you a lot of two hours of listening to me. That's how long I'm talking for. Okay. Okay. So now, this is him with that book. Well, we don't know which book he's got in his hand. But what's really great about this picture, well, and this is my interpretation, maybe it's wrong. But you can see the Tower of Babel behind him. And he's got the book. He's putting, and here we have Florence, civilized Florence. So what he's trying to say, I think, is with this book and the ideas in this book, we will not have the Tower of Babel. We will have civilized Florence. But actually, we shouldn't confuse him as a monolingualist because he actually was a multilingualist. He wanted a national language, locutio primaria, locutio secundaria, and grammatica. He wanted all these things together, but he wanted to fill in the gap that he didn't have, the national language. Okay? So this idea, as I say, is very deeply normalized within our national culture, even in Australia, because of course we're not a European country, but we are a Europeanized country. So once made, these languages spread. And you can see this in the theory of Antonio de Nebrija. Nebrija, Nebrija, no? Nebrija. Who wrote the first grammar of Castellano, the Castilian language, which he gave to Queen Isabella in 1492. And in the foreword he wrote, this is the other part of European language theory. He said, most illustrious queen, okay? One thing I find one thing I find and draw as a most certain conclusion, which he obviously didn't write in English, that always language was the companion of empire. This is the second great idea. Not only it's about identity, as Dante was telling us, but it's also about power. And followed it in such a way that jointly they began, grew and flourished, and afterwards was the fall of both. Because what the European languages did was not only create the national states here, but they created the colonial empires of the great European powers. But it's not just in Spain or France or Italy, but sorry, Spain or Italy, but also in France. We got a very special kick along with the French Revolution, where European nations, which were in this way unilingual in conception, suddenly did something else that was very special. They decided to do mass lingual socialization. And that starts with the French Revolution. And Talenot made a major contribution to this. What he could see was that the French language was expanding internationally through imperial reach into Africa and other places. And he thought it was terrible that you would have standard French, that you would have black people in Africa learning standard French, whilst in France, you would have people speaking what he thought were barbarous dialects and regional languages. He thought that was terrible. But he thought it for a democratic reason. This is the interesting thing. This sounds incredibly undemocratic to us, and it is now, in cultural terms, incredibly undemocratic. But he's got a very democratic idea in mind, the idea of citizenship. Because this is when European society gives birth to the idea of the idea that we all belong as equals if we have the same language, the same kind of language. So he says, who's going to do this? Obviously the government can't pass a law and make you speak standard French because you wouldn't even read the law. It doesn't matter what the law says. Someone's got to deliver it into the mouths of children. And who does that? Primary school teachers. Mother and father at home teach children how they tie their shoelaces. We can call that primary socialization. But in the school, teachers stand in the place of parents and they do secondary socialization on behalf of the state. 
that is doing what the baron, the good baron wants to make all these vestiges of feudalism. So he thinks multilingualism is like feudalism. So you can see the confounding of things. Now, of course, we don't want people to be feudal serfs, but it is going a bit too far to confound the languages and people's lives together. But that's what's going on here. You can see what I'm building up here, the idea of the nation, and then the idea of equality, a very special kind of equality, belonging as an equal citizen. So when people argue in ministries of education, we want everyone to be equal. Our government does it all the time. Aboriginal people will not be equal until they speak, not even English, but standard Australian English, because most Aboriginal people speak a Creole of English, which their teachers think is rubbish. Now, actually, a long time ago, variation of me was proved that that's not true. And, you know, you know the work of William LeBoff in New York, especially. He started the great studies of um, non-standard English, the great research into non-standard varieties of any kind, really, that they're just as logical as a standard language. Any language is a reasonable language. It's the basis on which people reason. My mother tongue was not a standard form of, uh, of a language. And when I first went to Italy speaking that kind of language, which is half Greek, I find a lot of people think, well, that's kind of rubbish, really. That's what people say to Aboriginal people all the time in Australia. You speak rubbish. Your language means you can't think. So if you can't think, it means you can't be equal. And if you can't be equal, you won't get a good job. But that is the weirdest idea of linguistics ever invented. When you go and look at it, you see it's nonsense. You might not know everything someone else knows, but it's not your language that stops you from having that. It's your not having read those things. See the point I'm trying to make? So, we exported that. Now you can see that in a country like Cameroon, exactly that this reads like the French Constitution, like exactly the clauses in the French Constitution. This is a country with 200 languages, plus English, plus French, and yet it got exactly the same reasoning of the French Republic. This is, if you took out Cameroon here, this would be the constitution of the French Republic. So we invent this idea, we make it natural, and then we export it around the world. But this whole history now is being completely undermined by many things, including new linguistics that I've been talking about. New ways to understand that actually the idea that dialects are intellectually inferior is just prejudice. It's just prejudice. It's just simply not true. Intellectually, we know it's not true. All the studies on logic prove that it's not true. It's scientifically proved. It doesn't mean you can't or shouldn't learn a standard form of language, but you do it for different reasons. You do it because there's more power for the standard form of language, not because you are unintelligent and you want to be intelligent. It's not because your children are stupid and you want them to be educated. And it's not because people are more cultured like Carrie in New York with her Cosmo ordering. That kind of fast talk is very prejudiced talk in a city where many black uh, children speak kinds of language around which there's constant discrimination. Within English in the world, there is enormous hierarchies of discrimination. So when people think about English and other languages, remember all of the things we say about the hierarchies between English and other are true within languages too. I bet they're true within Bulgarian. They're certainly true within Italian. They're certainly true within, I would say, every standard national language is full of this. It doesn't mean, and I'm not arguing against standard languages, I'm just saying that I'm, I'm arguing against prejudices, linguistic prejudices, which is just another kind of racism. Okay. So what we have, all of this thing is falling apart today because of mobility, networks and globalisation. We'll talk about each of these three. How long do I have? Because I think I'm going to talk for a long time here. I'll keep going. It doesn't matter. Well, if you fall over, I'll... Multiplication, we started late. So, multiplication of numbers, directions, uh, Lid mentioned this. If we look at this amazing work done by Castles and Miller, said, called The Age of Migration, we see that more people are on the move today than ever on Earth. 47 million people in any one year moving. Um, they move legally, 
illegally, semi-legally. Um, they move in all directions, from all directions, countries like Greece and Italy and Ireland that used to be countries of emigration and now countries of immigration. My parents' village in the south of Italy, 15,000 people, we used to be a city, lived in this, oh, maybe 5,000 so I'm exaggerating. 5,000 people lived there in 1912. There are more people from that place in Argentina and Boston and Melbourne than there are in that village. The schools in that village have children who were born in Cameroon and Egypt today. That's the world in only, in less than a century. Uh, they host children who are Muslim and black in a place where you have Catholic and white people living normally and naturally until poverty threw them away. So you have this incredible reversal of things, emigration, immigration. What we have, we can't even talk about it as migration anymore, it's just mobility because a lot of it involves return as well. Some of this is scary. We don't know where it's going to take us. Some of it is dangerous. I'm not trying to romanticize any of it. I'm just saying we have to accept it and understand it intellectually. And we have to understand also that the participants are very different. Migration historically was led by men who would go and establish like in chain migration, like all the Italians who went to Australia. Um, you know, 18 million people left Italy for the United States. 37 million uh, Italian Americans, more than many countries in Europe. But now, migration, Philippine migration, in Rome, for example, is female-led. Mostly women who leave their babies behind. Or they go to Korea or Japan and they intermarry. Incredible reversal of all things. They do, they do the kinds of jobs that aren't available to men anymore. There is a very deep gender change in how migration works these days. Duration, they, for longer periods, for shorter periods, itinerancy, you know, we know the Gustavite scheme that Germany had with Turkey with theoretically it was supposed to be return migration. It might happen, it might not happen. We have hundreds of kinds of these schemes. There's no variety of mobility that doesn't exist and more of them will exist in, in the future. We also have virtual mobility today as well. I can be in my office and be, well I did, I participated in one of your programs via satellite. So um, that kind of mobility and the purposes of it for study. The biggest, the third biggest industry in Australia today is education. We export education, even though students come to study in Australia. They come to study because they want to learn English and they want to do Australian degrees. And um, so even though we don't actually send anything in a ship, they come to us, we talk about export in that way. It's our third biggest industry. It didn't exist 15 years ago. Um, so credentialing and academic uh, study, but tourism, romance, criminality, everything is part of, of mobility today. And these produce things like nostalgia and memory. And we, I'm not going to talk much about this, but it means that in our cities, lots of people are physically here but mentally elsewhere. Lots of people are here in time, their temporal location is now, rather, but they live in the past, actually. When I first went to my parents' village, this is, sorry, I'm not going to do too many anecdotes, there was an old lady who heard me talk, and she called the young children, her children around, she made them sit down, and she said, listen to him. And I didn't know what she was talking about. I thought, this is crazy, what is she doing? Then I realised that I speak like her father. I have a highly fossilised form of our language. And the children just speak standard Italian now. So I was like a memory. My language is like my parents spoke when they left. This is normal. When you take something away, you freeze it. Partly because in the new society that you go to, you often are rejected. As we were, we're terrible, you know, incredible racism in Australia in those days. It's a very diverse society today and very pluralistic and very open and welcoming, but it was not like that once. So you see, when immigrants face this, they often close in on themselves. And this means you fossilize language, but you do it anyway because you have less contact with the hunger. So all of these things mean that diversity is not just physical and lingual, it's also mental, it's about nostalgia, it's about culture, it's about sentiment, all of these kinds of things. Okay. 
So, as we know, I'm get, I've already said this, we've basically got the city as the new experiment. But it's the, as Manuel Castell, the Spanish sociologist, has done extensive study on this, talks about the networks that people belong to are sources of identity, of cognitive link, of emotional connection to them. We did a study with Eritrean and Ethiopian children in Melbourne. When you talk to these children, they actually lived in four worlds. They lived in the world of the school where they were positioned by the teacher as being an African child who doesn't speak English and needs my help. And the children knew this and they were playing up to it or they performed the role the teacher gave them. When they went home, they were positioned by their parents as we're worried about our children because they don't speak our language anymore, although they really did, but they were speaking it mixed with English. But they're also mixing with people that we don't understand or know anymore. So the parents were nervous about their children, as all parents always are about their children, but extra for immigrants, because you know they lose, you're losing them in some way, right? More. But they were, actually would go online, and this is something incredible, and they were Tigrinya speaking children, they would use the Latin alphabet, because there wasn't a Latin alphabet for, uh, Tigrinya alphabet for them. And they were linking up with Tigrinya speaking children in Boston, in um, Buenos Aires and in Bologna in Italy as well as in Africa. This was a virtual identity community, another space which these children lived in. A space all to themselves. It was a space of their own identity. The school didn't know anything about that. If the school had known about that, they actually could have been able to use that incredible literacy and that spin, that we would say in Canada, that desire, that push for belonging much more positively, but the school didn't. The school treated them just as people who are the victims of being poor and need our help. But in fact, they could have treated them as multilingual children in a school which says we want everyone to be multilingual, and yet we ignore this incredible multilingualism that's just there in front of us. Schools do that all the time. This is one thing that Castells doesn't really talk much about language, unfortunately, but his work on networks is fantastic. What he shows you is that we are dealing with, someone mentioned Uber networks, I haven't heard that term before, but basically this is what, and these networks are within cities and they're multi-directional and Castell's work is really strong on this. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about this too much, but basically people tend to belong to economies. A large part of what we learned from the film Cos, that I mentioned at the very beginning, that stole the name of my talk, is that the financial identity of people is also important. We have a professional identity. All of us identify, I don't know, sociolinguists. It would be interesting to see here if you listed what your identities were. I mean, you'd give something about presumably a gender identity or kind of whatever other kinds of identities are the personal ones. You might be the best badminton player in Wagner and that might feature higher on your identity. We did studies with lots and lots of children about why and how they keep the languages going, including some work we did in Ireland on Irish. And we found that one of the most important things that happens with children and their identities is whether or not in the second or foreign language their preferred social identity can be continued. For example, if a child among his or her friends is the joker, the funny girl, the hilarious boy, the serious kid, the intellectual, this kind of personal identity, if your knowledge of the second language isn't good enough to allow you to have that identity that you like to belong to, a lot of those children discontinue. Not because they find French too hard or because they don't like German or because they find Spanish is too foreign or something else. It's often because they can't find their personal voice. So maybe we could call it that rather. So this is the kind of... We are an amalgam of multiple kinds of identities personal voice, our professional identity, our ideological, political views, our height, our strength, our sports, our whatever it is, you know, multiple kinds, not just our ethnic identities or our national identities. And that's why conferences succeed. We are a community of practice with that. Now, what do we do with all these things? I think that the first thing we have to think about is how we orient ourselves to the language problem that we face. Let's imagine that the problem we face, and this is true of all the reports that I saw, all of you were saying something like, we have multilingualism, we can see it in Utrecht, in London, 
in Hamburg, we can see it in Athens, we can see it in Barcelona, we can see it in all of these places. But it conflicts with the national language, the official language, and the official foreign language. Because the country might say, well, look, it's, you know, we have this a lot in Australia. Australians, want, we want to teach Japanese and Chinese, they're our main, most important languages, but the kids in our schools might speak to it. Turkish or whatever, so there's a con Arabic, there's a conflict between our official desired foreign language and the languages that kids have. Me, the ways of making minorities discounted are multiple. So, but the real problem, the ideological problem from a language planning point of view, is the problematization of multilingualism itself. We're seeing multiple languages as a problem. It's a problem for administration, it's a problem for efficiency. The first thing people will always say to you, how can we deliver education in lots of languages? Well, how many of you have ever been to Papua New Guinea? How many languages are spoken in Papua New Guinea? 868, okay, more or less. That's a lot more than is spoken in any European language, and these are all native languages, every single one of them. How many languages do you think they use in education in Papua New Guinea? Yes? One. One. How many do you think? One. How many do you think? What if I told you 350? It's true. They teach in 350 languages. It's impossible, you will think. How can they possibly do that? Easy. You just don't centralize everything. You decentralize everything. You give lots and lots of local decision-making authority to local areas. Now, they're not multilingual. They tend to be unilingual. But you decentralize. So if you start off with thinking that it's actually impossible to do it, it's what I call impossibilizing thought in language policy. If you start off with it's impossible, you will make it impossible. Because once you think it's impossible, you're going to make it impossible. But what they did was they used to teach in English. Of course, English is the most important language in the capital city and to get jobs of certain kinds. But in local villages, no one speaks English, no one cares about English. Everyone's only interested in their local language of identity because you have to do your ceremonies there. English has no power in a traditional ceremony. The languages perform traditional identity. You have to do the dances and songs and read the stories and stuff. You have to do them in the language. They only have power in the language. English has no power in those moments. So if you give the decision-making authority to all of those things and they employ local teachers, you could teach in a million languages, as long as you do it locally. Then, obviously, they sequence up in the upper high primary school, high school, and they teach um, in English in high school and university. So, I mean, that's not the solution for Bulgaria or for Europe, but it just shows you that it is a one way to think about multilingualism as not important. There are more languages in, <coughs> in India than there are in, in Europe, and you know, well, India has language like problems of the life. So all I'm trying to say is we have to stop thinking first of language as a problem. We have to start thinking of language either as a right. If we think of language as a right, this is a scheme started by the Cardinal Ruiz in the United States. Um, then we're going to have a lot of conflicts because people insist on their rights and we can't always deliver rights. Governments don't want to give rights. But if we think of language as a resource, we start to change the logic a little bit. We start to say it's a, an intellectual resource for the child learning the national language. If it's a minority child, a Turkish-speaking child learning uh, Bulgarian in a Bulgarian school, the language they already have is a large part of what they're going to bring to their learning. No matter whether the teacher ignores it or treats it as a resource, the child cannot help it. They have that language in their brain. If the teacher says, you know, the capital city is this or the history of Bulgaria is such and such, the child is translanguaging mentally always, inevitably. It's a cognitive resource for that child. It's also an emotional resource for that child within their home. It's a resource in many kinds of ways. As the child learns Bulgarian, they will have a double resource. So we have to think about languages in positive ways to start talking to administrators in ways that will get them on our side. Okay. Another way that's happening, this is from the UK, um, is a very interesting, a, a way to think about influencing policy. And I'm, I don't know if this is true in Germany or 
Holland or somewhere at the Netherlands or somewhere else. But in some countries, what I like to do is to look at what other um, ideologies are taking place within the country. What is it the country desires? They want to be economically efficient or they want to be this or that. If we think about whatever the country is trying to achieve, we can find a way to lock in multilingualism into that discourse. Now in the UK, they're starting to think about the idea of well-being. And in a lot of countries with social tension, they're thinking about social cohesion. I think this would be a big question in France, where they've had quite serious race riots in the, the last five years. So a promising new hook, I call this a hook, a way of hooking multilingualism to it. Thinking about how the government reasoning operates, and then deconstructing it and reconstructing it for language. When South Africa ended its apartheid regime in 1994, I spent a bit of time there in 95, 96, 97, and we wrote a report called the Reconstruction and Development Program, which looked at all these problems, industrial accidents in workplaces, and people were saying, well, the problem is they don't speak English. No, that's not actually the problem. The problem is that the supervisor talks to the workers in English, and they don't speak English, so they don't hear the safety instructions, then they fall over and kill themselves or something. They cost everyone a lot of money, including, obviously, the sad loss of some human life. But we started backwards with that, and we said, well, actually, if you see the multilingualism as the solution to the problem, rather than the problem, you will start to solve the problem better. Now, I'm not saying they did that. It's still very conflictual in South Africa. But that's part of what I'm trying to say here. Ride the wave. I don't know if you get any waves here in the Black Sea, but you ride the, we use surfing metaphors all the time in Australia. You ride the wave, and surfing the wave means understanding where the government's going. Now in the UK, well-being is a big one. They're interested in how, you know, social well-being, how communities come together. Do people feel like they belong in their communities? Do people feel alienated? Because People are worried about alienation. If you think people are worried about alienation, they're worried about crime. They're worried about social dislocation. They're worried about people not participating. They're worried about people not looking after their health. If everyone doesn't look after their health, they become a big bill for the state. They smoke too much. They drink too much. They drive cars and run over people and kill them. See what I mean? You start to think about the health logic. All these things, you then tie multilingual multilingualism into those arguments and you start to get a much more powerful uh, way of overcoming the problem. Okay, so well-being is one. These are some of the ways in which they're thinking about well-being in the United Kingdom. You can see all of them present great opportunities for multilingualism to be uh, built into there, but there's nothing yet on language and cultural diversity. So this is work for all the UK colleagues. You have to get onto your well-being people and tell them uh, to get their act together. Now, with language policy, formally, we tend to do problem identification. That's what I'm talking about now. The government says that the problem is multilingualism. You might say that the problem is failure to use multilingualism productively. The problem is failure to build on the resources that you have. If your country had lots of iron ore under the ground and you didn't extract that iron ore and sell it to Russia and China, that would be a failure to use your resources. It's the same kind of thing. It's not exactly the same, but it's got a similar kind of logic. So I think it's important not to start language policy planning at the end in schools, but start it at the beginning with the reasoning, the logic, where the government is thinking. Go through what the last things the Minister of Education said, the Minister of National Development said, the Prime Minister, the President, I don't know, and go through that and think of what they're trying to say and build in a logic for multilingualism within that. Then you specify some goals, you do some cost benefit. It's really important for us to do the language policies and present it to them. If they do the language policies, they're not going to give us what we want. Because most states, as I was saying before, think only in monolingual terms. They think of multilingualism as a problem, and they think of national languages as threatened. They are not threatened by multilingualism because national languages are actually reinforced by multilingualism because there is a need for lingua franca within a country. They have to provide for the learning of the national language by minorities. 
That is a part of all language policies. It's very important that minorities also push the national language. That's another way of building an argument for um, a multilingual policy. That's what we did in Australia. Um, I'm going to talk very quickly now because um, um, uh, people are probably... What time is lunch? No. <laughs> oh, okay. One of the, this is moving beyond the argument of policy very quickly. The, the ways in which sociologists... Have, I think the Lucy Project offers the promise of helping us to rethink um, sociolinguistic organisation of multilingualism. This is uh, Abraham de Swan's idea of the sun and the moon and the stars. And in his idea of the sun and the moon and the stars, English is the hypercentral sun around which the central languages, the supercentral languages, the peripheral languages move. Now, I think this is a kind of damaging organisation of things. It's empirically correct, I'm not arguing against it, but I think we have a need to do some work that empowers multilingualism more. Um, I was going to talk about that, I won't do that. And then I'm going to talk about how we do this language policy. I want to do this very quickly before we, we break for lunch. I've come halfway across the world that I think I should uh, at least uh, uh, get through this. When a language researcher does language research, when you people have done your studies, you have produced something that we call knowledge. Okay? It's obvious, we call knowledge. And we tend to think that knowledge has no power. Because people in government, I'm sorry to say this, maybe Bulgarian politicians are incredibly knowledgeable and wonderful. The politicians in my country, last week they were probably doing something else. You know, now they're in politics and they're the Minister for Education. Last week they were a lawyer. We tend to get a lot of lawyers who are ministers of education. And believe me, they don't know much about education. Or they could have been selling cars. That's what happens in a democratic system. We have Elected people are not experts in their fields, but you are experts. But we tend to think, this is another prejudice that we have, that knowledge has no power because politicians never listen to research. How many politicians read your research studies? They don't read mine, so unless you're luckier than me, they don't tend to. We have to change what we produce to make it relevant to policy. Now in policy sciences, this is called knowledge utilisation. And we can influence how they take on our research into <coughs> policy. I'm going to go through this quickly through seven acts. I have to do this very quickly, but I hope you find it interesting. We start off with this guy. There's a picture of him in the wonderful, wonderful painting by Raphael in Rome called The School of Athens. As you can see, he's pointing to the sky. Next to him is Aristotle, who's pointing down. Um, now, one of the things that Plato did was he went to Syracuse in southern in Sicily to do a consultancy. He was like Lid King, employed by the European Union to do a consultancy, I don't know, in Armenia or somewhere or other. And someone said to him, help me solve this problem. And look, this is a very, very interesting story. I can tell you all about it. And what Plato said, he told her, and I just the wrong message. He said, stop being so... Stop your wine, women, and so on. Become an ascetic, learn mathematics, stop being rich. The people will respect you more if you're not exploiting them all the time. Of course, this is not what Dionysus was interested in, so he sent him back to Athens. He said, go away. You're telling me to be poor and be good? I don't want to be poor and good. I just want to be the boss, right? Uh, which is what a lot of rulers want. Now, so Plato goes off and he says, how can I deal with this? He knows nothing about how to be powerful. So Plato comes up with this idea that you must combine the philosopher, knowledge, and power, the king. You must, you must combine them and they must be ascetic. Now, he has a very anti-democratic view of how it happens, as we know, with Plato. But he's forced out because Dionysus does not want to be an ascetic. But this is the first way of thinking about public policy in the Western tradition the platonic one, which was combine in one person knowledge and power. Now, today, as we know, researchers typically don't have power, politicians typically don't have knowledge. Um, so we have the opposite, we have the philosopher in the universities and the king in the parliament, which is a contradiction, of course. Then we have Machiavelli. Now, a lot of people in British society, I'm afraid, don't like 
Machiavelli, but that's because he has a bad reputation in England. In fact, he's a great genius of power, and we'll leave that aside for a moment. But Machiavelli does the opposite of, um, of uh, Plato. He actually says, actually, we can create a group of people, we'll call them advisors, who are like mediators between knowledge and power. Now, every political system has advisors today. He invents this, I he didn't really invent it, but he did theorize about it. He said, if you are an advisor, you're between the king and the philosopher. You get, take the knowledge of the philosopher and you apply it to political systems. And you do it through realism. You're not interested in moralism, as we know that's what gets him into trouble. We'll go on. So he joins what Plato separated. We'll go on. The English then took a different pathway through utilitarianism and pragmatism. And then we had, we'll just skip right forward to the kind of power um, language policy making, policy making in general that we have today, which starts in New York in the 1950s. And it's against, the, it's in the Cold War and it's against the Soviet bloc. And it basically says, we can make government perfect. And we can make government perfect by making it scientific. And you make it scientific by getting researchers produce perfect knowledge. And the way researchers produce perfect knowledge is by doing empirical, objective, quantitative research, which produces uncontestable information. That's then given to politicians. And you're a politician. I give you my perfect... And you think, oh my God, it's solved. I just have to implement it. So it's a very naive view. It's a little bit platonic in some way. Very naive view, and it basically fails all the time. Because what he doesn't understand is that policy and policy and research and politics are also ideological. Um, I'll skip all this because it's going to take too long. But now we have a much better system, and I can tell you quickly some of the ways in which we as researchers can get policy makers interested in our research. Now imagine yourselves as the producers of the Lucy case studies. How can you get the municipal officials in your city and the national politicians interested and knowledgeable about your work? Well, the first thing you have to know is the three I's. It doesn't mean I, 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 there's narcissism in like New York or anything like that. It means information, ideology, and interests. We have to, when we think about a politician, we have to think that they, like us, everybody, works with these three things. We, are, we everybody, we're not, you know, researchers are no better than anybody else. We're more open to new knowledge because we read stuff, but we're not actually better at taking up new information. That's been shown very clearly. Um, we resisted uh, a lot of it because it doesn't conform to paradigms we have. But they work with paradigms and they work in this system. The information that they already have, the ideology that they already have, and the interests they have. Now, no one is going to take up your research if the information conflicts utterly with what they have. So if they already have an idea that multilingualism is bad, and you have an idea that multilingualism is good or necessary or inevitable, don't start with the argument of multilingualism or the information. Don't start with information. That's knowledge, and it's not power in this case. You have to start off with either ideology or interests. And interests means, why does anyone do anything anyway in politics? Well, let's not be too cynical about it, but we can be a little bit cynical about it. And we know that most of them want to be re-elected, and there's a whole lot of benefits involved with being power, exercising authority, making decisions, advancing their ideology. If we understand the dynamics, and obviously this is a big and complex story, and I can't talk much about it, um, maybe this afternoon or tomorrow we can go through it later if you're more interested in it. We can actually find ways to write what we uh, know to them that advances the chances of it being adopted. Very importantly, we have to not lead with reports. We can't send them a detailed report. We have to send them an operational plan. What would my research in Hamburg look like if it was an actual policy that you were running in your hospital. Okay, then they can get it. So we have to tell them a story that's applicable in their context in which you infiltrate the knowledge you have produced. Okay, 
I'm going to stop very soon, but just to say, when a politician isn't, but even an academic, is given research knowledge, whether they use it or not, depends on filters. And these filters are the information they already have, the ideology that they uh, uh, have and what they think about your ideology, and the interests they have. You can create a level of investment for them by giving them a story that can work for them. By giving them an operational version of what you have produced so that they could see themselves being the person promoting it. They're not going to give you credit for it, or not very much, unfortunately. Politicians don't do that. You have to understand the capability of absorption. Now, this is a very polite way of saying some of them are not going to understand it. I'll be sorry, there's no polite way of saying this. Some of them just are dumb, or they're silly, or they're irritating, or they've got very bad political views. Some people are hopeless and you're never going to get anywhere with them. Okay, so you have to find the right person in the first place. The capacity of absorption, but they might be also too busy. Think of Machiavelli, the advisor. Think of the advisor, persuade the advisor first. It can be contestable. Think of all the things they would say against it and come up with reasons and responses. Think of all the opposition that they will come. Have your own group get together and play devil's advocate, as we say. All the ways in which someone would argue against your recommendations. And so on. Okay, I'm not going to finish this. I'm going to finish. Um, there's lots of studies being done on the things that facilitate and the barriers that uh, 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 against <coughs> utilisation of knowledge. I'm going to finish there and say that basically these are processes of uh, crashing through. I, I hope that's been interesting to you. Basically what I wanted to say to you that we can learn from our uh, traditions of knowledge creation, ways in which we can make the research that we produce relevant to policy makers greatly increase the chances of it getting up. It's valid in its academic and scholarly terms, but that is a different audience. That produces different kinds of publications, different destinations. When it's intended for policy makers, we have to make an effort to understand the world they live in, the mental processes they go through, and our political history of understanding the relationship between knowledge and power. They're the two dynamics, and we are seen by them as people who have knowledge but no power. We have to make our knowledge more powerful by understanding the processes mentally they operate. Thank you very much for your attention. I mean, it, it is amazing, and um, thank you very much, because you did literally travel halfway across the world to, to be here. Um, the, the, there are so many points, um, and you know, it's an ombre de choix where we can comment, but if I just go right towards the end, and I think this is interesting with the three eyes, and um, again, if we've got a big elephant march English in the room, the other one is the sort of, I don't know, perhaps another other, that is how do you get people to listen? And how do you do it? And I think that is where the next thing is. There are lots of examples. There are lots of images of practice. It's the I, I, I thing that's coming up of how do you get them to do it. Do you think it's just a question of you looked at formulas, you looked at drive and saying if you have a bit of this, a bit of that, you put it, that's a success route. Or is it really a case of having to try different approaches, reanalyzing? Is there, again, a simple way or is it a question of always reapproaching? It's a really good question. I, I think what you have to do, there's no, uh, there's no gen, these are general patterns that apply, but what you do in Utrecht depends on what your particular problem is, your context. Now imagine that case. Well, maybe I'll be wrong because I don't know. I'll just be too abstract for talking about Utrecht. Or, or Melbourne. Okay. Well, we, we had a problem where the government was interested in foreign languages, literally foreign languages that no one spoke. And we had to make bridge a gap between 
foreign languages that no one spoke, that the government wants, because they think we have to support our trade and export industries into Japan and Asia. And, but we have schools full of children that don't speak these languages. We're going to make them doubly disadvantaged. They don't speak English and they don't speak the foreign language we want to promote. So what did we do? The first thing we started a series of breakfasts with journalists. Unfortunately, maybe they're, not, maybe they're much nicer in Bulgaria, but we have to feed our journalists literally as well as mentally to make them take our side. And journalists are very important because one thing that politicians read very quickly is journals, uh, is newspapers. So we had to get them putting into the press um, little articles taking our point of view. And the most important way to influence policy really is to do a, a critical evaluation of practice. If your minister loves this program and you do an evaluation of it which proves it doesn't work, the press will be after you. And they will invite you to say, Nick, can you tell us, please, why the program doesn't work? And you say, well, actually, it's badly designed. The minister didn't think about it. The minister will be reading that and will be asking his or her advisor, what is this guy on about? What does he know? If he doesn't like you, he's first say, what would he know as an academic? So that's a dangerous way to engage in upfront criticism. So what you have to do is see some positive messages first. This could work if it were improved in the following kinds of ways. And the way we did it in that case was to say that the child is always translanguaging. How are they going to learn Japanese if they speak Turkish at home and they're learning English? So we had the concept introduced in newspapers by making it interesting. The newspapers, after two or three months, we had the minister inviting us to a discussion. And we prepared very carefully for that. We anticipated what he might say to us by looking at all the press releases he put out for six months beforehand, by looking at his policy statements, and never going in and just arguing against him, but by saying, you're trying to achieve this if we understand it. Always trying to put ourselves as people who didn't quite know, because we have to put him in a position where we acknowledge that he is powerful, and we're not powerful. Unfortunately, Ego is a very major part of politics. Maybe in Bulgaria you have non-egotistical politicians. In Australia they're all very egotistical. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of play it like that. Then what you do is you problematise his approach with positive solutions to it. And we had behind us already quite a lot of support from the schools. And you have to build the various communities. Look, I could extend this at length, but just to cut it short, you can do it. If it's a hospital, and we've, we've worked a lot with hospitals that have a very... The way hospitals dismiss the multilingual message is very harsh. They say, we're interested in people's health and safety and you're just on about something ephemeral and unimportant. But actually there are really serious consequences to people's lives and health by misunderstanding things. And here we managed to get some doctors who were from minority communities, nurses from minority communities, and we had seminars. We worked with them very slowly, and we got we learned their language, their way of describing things. And again, we seeded things into the press, we seeded things into the councils of the without going public and hitting them. But I mean, we've had very good interpreting and translating services, and multicultural services in our hospital since 1972. Before then, we had absolutely nothing, and now they realise that actually, you know, they, they do all their own studies, they find that people's, uh, it's, that multilingualism is actually much more e efficient than monolingualism. If you have a multicultural population and you treat them monolingually, you produce inefficiency. But that's what governments always think about, efficiency. Because the language of government is economics. And the biggest principle of economics is efficiency. How can I get most return for a small investment? And so we have to understand that language and we go to them with a message that says you get the most return in a multilingual community by being multilingual or bilingual or trilingual or whatever it is. But you have to prove it and you can prove it because the evidence is there. Um, but you target the particular problem and the voice of that powerful individual. Um, you mentioned hearts and minds and people celebrated, schools celebrated.
right to what we were looking earlier in the talk. Um, and children themselves and families themselves, we don't value their own multilingualism very often, at least from my experience. Yeah. How, how, I mean, that, because that is sort of, that's the other side of that argument, yeah. isn't it? But what Where we would have to, sorry, to encourage that, you know, and to empower people themselves first and make them value. Well, you don't have to do it first. You can act on several, several fronts at once. But, but you're absolutely right. People internalize. What I was saying before, if you ask Aboriginal people about their languages, they will, not all of them by any means, but activists don't. But many people say, oh, you know, it's not a language you can think in, or it's not a language, you know, silly things like that. Because they internalize the external society, powerful judgments about yourself. Minorities always do that. You think of any particular group, they don't have to be ethnic minorities, they always internalize critical judgments of themselves. It's one of the ways of coping with being positioned as a minority is to believe what is said about you. Because you think, well, if I'm poor and I'm the margins of society, maybe I deserve it. Maybe it's because of my own failings. Now, this is a subtle psychological problem. All of these things are linked with each other. And the ways we do that is by having much more education about language, about language diversity, about, you know, not all languages are equal in power, but they are equal linguistically. You know, they're not equal in power and they're not equal in society. We know that. We just have to go out into the real world to understand that. But, but there's an, an Australian Aboriginal language has much, much more complex grammar than English by any margin. Um, and when we have education about these things, we find incredible prejudice about it. People don't even call them languages. They call them dialects, not because they're being linguists and being precise, but because they're being pejorative. They're saying that we will not even dignify them with the name of a language. And of course, when you ask these children, they say they put their head down and they roll around and they feel ashamed and all that sort of stuff. They have basically bought into society's picture of them. Now, that's always the case because even migration is seen as a kind of failure. You know, for many people, I couldn't survive in my own society, I couldn't live. And in fact, Hans Kloss, a famous um, German-American sociologist, said that the dominant view in American society, and it was true, was that migrants have to pay a price for migration, and the price is that you sacrifice your language. The society will not welcome you until they see that you become a monolingual. That's how we psychologically punish minorities. But that's crazy because we have to get into the idea that actually being a bilingual is better than being a monolingual. And being a bilingual in a society in which you speak the national language plus English plus your own language is triply good. It's no threat to the national language. But we have to take seriously. Too many minority groups, I see this in Burma where I work, because people have been persecuted by this society a lot, when I try to get them to work towards compromise solutions, they often don't want to do what you need to do. You can't turn around and um, you, have, you have to be constructive. Because if, a, if minority groups are rejecting the wider society completely, what happens is that the wider society says, there, that's proof of what we say about them. See what I mean? You have to be strategic about this. I'm not saying wrap yourself in the flag. All I'm talking about is being constructive and strategic and accept that children will need the national language they will need them. They will get better acquisition of the national language by building on their own language. That's so proved, well proved scientifically, we don't even need to argue it. Um, and that they'll be better trilinguals if they're bilingual. So if they must learn English, they're going to learn English better if they've learned their first language in Bulgarian or Greek, or whatever language we are talking about. But all the, argue, the scientific arguments are on our side, but they don't have any political traction. The problem is not the science, the problem is making the science count in the context of power. But it's still a top-down approach then. Pardon? It's still a top-down approach. No, no, no. We have a bottom-up and a top-down approach. The bottom-up approach is the people who feel pride. I'm only talking about, I'm selecting one part of it now for exposition now, but we definitely do the other as well. It's, it has to be both. You cannot have... Um, the top telling the bottom how to feel if the bottom doesn't feel that way. No, that couldn't work. Please, if I could ask you a question. Um, 
another question for you. Thank you very much for this really inspiring and mind opening presentation from a really broad perspective. And, um, do you think that the um, modern legal habitus will come back automatically with a lot of time? With all these processes that are happening now that you described and all these blurring of nation states and borders. And the monolingual habitus. The multilingual. Uh, the multilingual. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, I think it's really important. You know, when I put up the um, the uh, uh, galaxy system that Ed Abram de Swan, Swan has, that's a system that works very well for English. I think we, through Lucy, we have an academic job to do to improve. We, we need a new taxonomy of multilingualism, which makes, which normalizes multilingualism. But in normalizing multilingualism, this is something that Lorna was saying before, we have to normalize the idea that you don't have to be equally proficient in everything. You can have, and this is not for strategic reasons, it's for realistic reasons. Like, you know, I worked in the Pacific Islands for a while, I worked in Samoa. I learned quite a bit of Samoan when I was there. I don't know that anymore. When I was there, it was strategic and useful for me. It was really important for me to live with my neighbors and talk to them and stuff like that. So that's a temporary language proficiency I had. I know if I wanted to recover that, I could. Um, so this is normal. We have to get people to think that languages can be like this as well. We have, might have, so we need to label our language capabilities in a different way from how they have. I don't know what the answer to this is. We have to work on it. I think it's a task for us to work on. Um, so partial proficiencies, temporary proficiencies, stable ones, shifting ones, reflexive ones, bilingual dialogue. We need lots of thinking about this. That's why I think the EU should, and Council Europe should really support much more work on this because Europe is where many of these problems will be solved in the future because you have to solve them now because of the transnational thing. But you're absolutely right, we have to normalize the multilingual habitus. Now in ordinary life in India, that's not a problem. Everyone just knows you have multiple scripts, it's not just languages, it's scripts. That's the other problem with these things, it's always just languages, but I think it's multiple. Languages, scripts, and communicative practices. One of the language discrimination things in the world is about people's speaking style. You know, that's why I started off, it might not have been that obvious, the speaking style of sex in the city is saying, well, within English we have, you know, our kind of English, which is very cool and hip, and other people's English, which is not so cool and hip, and then other people's English, which is rubbish. Well, I think we should all be, that should be part of the same struggle for multilingualism. I think it's important to include multiple kinds of arguments for basically non-language, no-language kinds of discrimination. You see the point in front of me? To make ex people's expressive rights acknowledged, that people have got a right to express themselves in ways. And the deepest principle that we have to get in is the fact that languages are functionally specialised. You, you know, the oldest principle of sociolinguistics is that no one needs two languages to do the same things with. So, if you're a minority language or a national language, don't aspire to be like English because um, if two languages are trying to do the same thing, the weaker language will die. That's unfortunately the rule of the sociolinguistic jungle. So languages have to be differentiated somehow. If you, you know, in, in, Para, in, in Paraguay, you have got the only country in the Americas where Spanish you know, other than Brazil, where Spanish is the one. It's the only country in which the indigenous language is used all the time. It's like uh, Swiss German and High German in, in, in Switzerland. You have diglossia, stable, long-term diglossia. And that's because the multilingual habitus took root there, but not in other parts of um, the Spanish America. So everybody speaks both Guarani and Spanish, and they expect to do it. And, and Guarani is not regarded as a bad language, it's regarded as a language of the heart. So even white Spanish-speaking Paraguayans speak Guarani in their homes. And that's because it has a different role from Spanish. You know, but it's made Guarani strong. 
So we know that from minority languages, you can't expect them to do what English does. Bulgarian will never do that. But, but, but English will never do what Bulgarian does. Do you see what I mean? So the multilingual habitus comes around understanding unique functions of languages or unique roles. I hope I'm answering that. Are there any other questions or comments on what we've heard? Well, if not, maybe we have to close uh, this session. Absolutely. I'm just going to, as I said, I warned you I was going to pop up again like this. A, I'd like to thank all the speakers, but Joe, thank you so much for, for really wanting to, leaving us, but wanting, to, wanting you to give us a lot, lot more. And perhaps when we look at the um, timetable at the end of, of today, we can perhaps think of you as more of a panel and coming when we're looking at ways forward as well. And we can reapproach. I would like to say as well that um, what you were talking very much what I call flexilingualism. The idea is you are actually very good. you know looking at languages, picking things up, dropping them, picking another language up, and keeping this attitude. And of course what we got with economic mobility is forced flexilingualism that people are going to have to do if they're going from Greece to Germany to work and other languages. Well, we were 15 minutes academically late. We've now entered the world of Cary and Cosmopolitan being 30 minutes fashionably late. Now that it really is there. So, anymore, and I don't know what stage of lateness we get into. Um, so, I know that, that um, we have, you've got an amazing lunch organised for us, and I think we're outside. In the garden. In the garden, outside. So, um, uh, Let's just, just, just said something we with the next I think well, we'll go to come back a little bit later and we are um, we are running half time next. So we should be coming back probably um, 50 I'm trying to think when are we going to come back? About 13.45 we should try and aim to be back in the room. So we shall uh, eat.